Hello friends, welcome to my channel. My name is Brooke and you look lovely today. This is my September wrap up. I almost said October, but it's September. Last month I didn't do a wrap up because I vlogged the entire month so you saw everything if you cared to watch them all. This month since I am trying out a different vlogging style that basically only covers one book, I thought I would do a wrap up to actually show you everything that I read. I know most people film their wrap ups in one sitting, but you will notice me in various outfits throughout this video because I filmed it in multiple clips. I just filmed like clip by clip as I had time, as I had books to discuss, just because this month was really hectic for me and it was hard to find time to film. I wanted all my thoughts to be fresh and you're gonna get me kind of in real time and a little vloggy but more formal so let's get into it the first book i read this month was cinderella liberator by rebecca solnit i picked this up from my library because i really enjoy rebecca solnit's non-fiction feminist writings she is the author of men explain things to me which is the essay from which the concept of mansplaining originated i read her during college and i also love fairy tale retelling so when i saw that she had come out with her debut children's book, which was a fairy tale retelling of Cinderella, I just had to check it out. It is so adorable. I loved it so much. It doesn't change the story of Cinderella that drastically. Cinderella still lives with her stepmother and her stepsisters who treat her like a servant. She still goes to the ball to meet the prince with some help from her fairy godmother but then the story takes a bit of a twist cinderella and the prince do become friends and they help each other realize their best selves cinderella wants to be a baker and open a cake shop and the prince wants to be a farmer and not have quite all the responsibilities that princes have because princes don't have any friends apparently cinderella's stepsisters also get a happy ending once they're out from under the thumb of their stepmother cinderella's mom even ends up coming back in this and it's just so good. I'm gonna read a couple of quotes that I really liked that I posted on my Twitter. So there's a lot of discussion about how the stepsisters think that beauty will make them happy. And in that section, Rebecca Solnit writes, Well, there are a lot of people with a lot of ideas about beauty and love. When you love someone a lot, they just look like love. And then in a section where she's talking about the stepmother's greed and how she's worried that there's not enough, there's this quote. There's always enough for everyone, if you share it properly, or if it has been shared properly before you got there. There is enough food, enough love, enough homes, enough time, enough crowns, enough people to be friends with each other. And then I really liked this one. It's about the concept of happily ever after. Besides, there is no happily ever after, only this bedtime story, and nighttime, and then tomorrow morning, and the day after that, and the day after that, and the spring coming after the winter, and the summer after the spring, and the earth going around the sun, and the lizard sitting on the wall in the sunlight, and the mice coming out in the moonlight to eat the cake crumbs. So as you can see, there's a lot of good messages in this book. There's a lot of really subtle changes that have a big impact, I think. The art is also done by Arthur Rackham, who actually illustrated a lot of fairy tale retellings a long time ago. He has been dead since hold on it says 1939 but they repurposed a lot of his silhouette art for this story specifically and I like the way that they did that it's like a retelling both through words and through pictures the next book I finished was I'm not dying with you tonight by Kimberly Jones and Gilly Segal this book is about two girls Campbell and Lena who have to work together to get home when a mass disturbance or race riot breaks out at their high school football game. I primarily read this because it was the Barnes & Noble Y Book Club September pick. However, the race riot issue also really intrigued me. The summary on the inside flap does not use the word riot or mass disturbance. It just says sudden mass chaos, which didn't really interest me. But since I had to read this book, I was doing my research on it, and then I figured out what it was really about, and I was like, that's awesome, and I'm in. <laughs> I did an entire vlog and review of this book, and I will link that if you wanna check it out, so I'm not gonna go super into depths on that, but this is the only book that I gave an actual reading to, and I gave it four out of five stars. Then, I'll say I did a try a chapter 
for The Evil Queen by Jenna Showalter. I was really excited for this book. It is a Snow White retelling told in a world where fairy tales are prophecies rather than legends and our main character Everly is destined to be the Evil Queen in Snow White. Also she can talk to mirrors. Also the real world setting is set in Oklahoma which is where I'm from and I thought that was all gonna be bomb. However at 17 pages I thought that I was gonna hate this. And so I told myself if at the end of chapter one, which was page 35, I still thought that I was not going to read it. So I did not read it. I think the plot in this book is probably pretty solid. And I think I would have enjoyed that element, but the writing was not for me in a big, big way. I felt like it was very cliche and kind of contrived and I did not want to read 500 pages of that. So I'm not gonna. I can't say anything else about the book beyond the first chapter because I didn't read it, but I just wanted to say that that's why I ended up not reading it. Then I picked up the next book on my novel inspiration list and that was The Bone Witch by Ren Chupeka and thank goodness we finally had a winner. This book is set in a fantasy land with eight kingdoms. We follow Tia, who at the beginning of the book accidentally raises her brother from the dead. After that event, she discovers that she is a dark Asia, Asia meaning witch, or bone witch, which is actually a derogatory term. I really enjoyed this book. There's kind of a dual timeline going on, and as the story progressed I was just more and more eager to see how those were going to come together and what secrets were going to be revealed that were being hinted at in one of them about the other one. That was not exactly all the way resolved however there are three books in this series so I can understand that. I really liked the magic in here and I think Ren Chupeka did a great job with politics seeing as there are eight separate kingdoms in this world. I am very eager to read the next two books in the series, although I don't know when that's going to happen either because there's a lot of books and things coming up on my schedule, but I might just swipe some of those and keep going anyway. Then I read another book for my novel, this time for research rather than inspiration more so, and that was Beyond Magenta, Transgender Teens Speak Out, written and photographed by Susan Cucklin. I found this book for my research as I mentioned in my library book haul because Rick Riordan referenced this book for his research and I thought if it worked for him, it could work for me. In this book, Susan Cucklin has interviewed and photographed six transgender teens. I thought this book did a really great job of emphasizing that transness is a spectrum. There's gender queer people, there's non-binary people, there's intersex people, and I think this book did a great job of exploring that. I also think this book did a great job of emphasizing the teenage perspective because as a teenager, the experiences you have in elementary school and middle school still hold a lot of weight. Of course they do throughout your life, but I think that kind of diminishes as your experiences build. I think that was a great thing for me to really pay attention to as I get older and kind of forget that. The one qualm that I kind of had with this book that she does dress a little bit in the author's note is that five out of the six teens are all from New York City. Even though they have diverse cultural, racial, and economic backgrounds, I kind of felt like it could have been branched out more across the country because someone's experience in New York City is gonna be very different from someone's experience in the Midwest. However, the last teen profiled in the book is from Wisconsin and Susan Cucklin does address that geographical diversity issue in her author's note because most of her contacts did come from one specific trans clinic resource in New York City and she did make an effort to reach out to at least one more person and to make room in her book for a more diverse geographical perspective. I enjoyed this book for the most part. I found its perspectives valuable. There were a few times when I was a bit uncomfortable that is to be expected, I guess, when reading from the perspective of someone who is very different from you. Mainly, this happened in the kind of middle two profiles. One, because the teen was neglected and abused in her home and was several times admitted to mental institutions. Another, because a teen who identified as gender fluid slash intersex kind of talked down on feminine women things 
and not just in a way that from their perspective it was not for them. There's some points where they talk about the things that girls like to talk about as stupid instead of just not for them and I kind of thought that was bashing on femininity. I realize you have to take into consideration the context and the feelings of the person talking but I still was a little mm, about that. In that same profile there's also some questionable wording about bisexuality where they straight up say gay people but when they talk about bisexual people they say people who think they're bisexual and it gave me some bi erasure vibes that I didn't really like so the middle of the book was kind of uh, for me not because I wasn't learning but just because different people have different perspectives and sometimes those can be uncomfortable. I hope those points just made sense because I felt like I was a little all over the place while I was talking. And Take two of this clip. Do you ever put makeup on at 10 o'clock at night because you filmed this clip already in the morning but then decided you hated it and so you want to redo it? No? Just me? For the last week-ish of September, I wanted to really focus on getting some smaller, quicker library books finished so that I could return some things. First, I read Nightlights and Hikoti, both by Lorena Alvarez. These are juvenile graphic novels along the lines of Hilda and the Tea Dragon Society, I believe. My hold for the Tea Dragon Society still doesn't come in, so I can't really say for sure, but it's kind of that big size, 40 pages, beautiful art kind of thing. In Nightlights, the main character, Sandy, Sandy, yes, sees these lights in her room while she sleeps, and she takes them and she turns them into these magic creatures that they, she later draws when she wakes up. It's a really smart allegory for creativity and what happens to your art when other people see it and you start worrying about what they think and self-doubt creeps in. In Hakoti, Sandy goes to the wetlands with her science class on a field trip and she finds a turtle shell. And when she looks in the turtle shell, she discovers that there's a whole world inside it where a turtle named Hakoti lives with all her art. It's a little more complicated. There's a lot more threads and symbols in it, I think. Maybe I'm just thinking too much about a kid's graphic novel. <laughs> but I'm not really sure which one I liked more because they each had something going for them. I'm going to show you some of the art, though, because it's beautiful. Like, I need some copies of these, y'all. Then I read the graphic novel Modern Fantasy by Rafer Roberts and Kristen Gutsnick. I picked this one up because I thought it would be along the lines of Moonstruck, where mythical creatures are living everyday life, and it was that. However, I didn't like it quite as much, and I think there are a few reasons for that. Number one, these are different kinds of fantasy creatures, if that makes sense. In Moonstruck, the creatures are based more on mythology, I think, whereas in this one, they're more based on, like, video games and Dungeons and & Dragons and that sort of thing that I'm not really into. Like, the main character is what's called a ranger, and I had to call my dad and be like, um, you used to play World of Warcraft. Uh, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> So I didn't quite get as many of the cute references that are sprinkled throughout here as I did in Moonstruck. Also, these characters are a bit older than in Moonstruck. Moonstruck, they're like still in college here. They're a few years out of college, in day jobs, figuring out what they're doing with their lives. <laughs> Relatable. And that mixed with the mob, the mob plotline and like the demon plotline made this a lot darker. So even though it was funnier, it just didn't quite have the same vibe. I think that's also because the art is darker. So while I enjoyed this, I can't say that I liked it near as much. And maybe that's unfair of me to compare them like that. But that's the whole reason I read this. So Then I picked up the graphic novel Sweetie by Sean Dillon and Steven Petravelli. I picked this one up because I've been seeing a lot of women superheroes and women of color superheroes in comics. However, most of them are within the Marvel Universe, and while I'm sure you don't need to read every Marvel Universe book to understand them, I am not ready to commit to that big of a world that has like a bajillion people in it. So when I saw this one, I was like, ha ha, non-Marvel, let's go. Sweetie, or Maggie as her name actually is, is a self-taught superhero. She's always loved comics and action movies and she taught herself all the moves that she saw in them. She saw a move that was cool, she taught it to herself. And now she's a fucking badass in ninth grade. Of course, there are some 
bad guys that she has to deal with in this because it is a superhero book but I think mainly it's about friendship how to make friends and how you have to put work into that. I really enjoyed the art in this book and the colors especially although sometimes because it is so actiony because it's superhero the colors made it hard for me to follow what was happening especially in the first chapter while I was getting used to the art style. Another thing there is anxiety representation in this book. Maggie does have anxiety. I'm gonna show you some panels. These specific ones are from chapter four where the anxiety becomes really explicit. This is her having sort of intrusive thoughts when she feels like a lot of people are looking at her and thinking of what they're thinking of her. These are all things that she assumes people are saying about her but that they aren't really. And there are other hints to that as well when she talks about having trouble expressing herself and all of that. So it was a pretty cute read. While I was reading those, I was also reading Click by 10 different people that I'm not going to list right now, but will list below in the description. I talked about this in my library book haul video that has already gone up. I don't think I explained it that well there because there is no actual description on this book, but I did realize that there is a one sentence summary on the copyright page, so I'm going to read that to you guys. Turn up for Library of Congress. Stories within a story, written as separate chapters by 10 juvenile authors, reveal the adventurous life and legacy of George G. Keene, a photojournalist and world traveler. So I think in that video I said it was about freedom of the press, which it's, that was wrong. <laughs> it, ha it, it did have to do with journalism because he's a photojournalist, but also he's dead. And so you see people's memories of him and he's talked about, but he's like never actually in the story. If that makes sense. I really enjoyed this. I thought this was really interesting and smart. So if you want something like that that's fast, I would suggest this. It covers a broad timeline from G's youth and people's memories of him then when they were young all the way to his granddaughter's old age. There are also some magical realism elements in this book that you get hints of at the beginning but they become way more apparent towards the end. So if you're into that, I really suggest this. Then we have the best book that I read this month, the masterpiece, My Love, Bloodwater Paint by Joy McCulloch. This is a novel in verse, at least mostly, there are some small prose snippets, about the life of Artigma, what's her last name? Oh, I'm gonna say this so wrong. Gentileneschi, who is a famous Italian painter who lived at the beginning of the 1600s. This book follows her in her late teens as she struggles to be a woman painter in a world ruled by men and also experiences rape and has to deal with the repercussions of that. Her mother died when she was 12. That's not a spoiler. I think it's even in the summary. But when she was alive, she told Artemisia stories of strong women from the Bible and Artemisia remembers those stories as the story progresses and she draws a lot of strength from them and those are the little prose snippets that are scattered throughout here. They're her mother's voice and she's remembering her mother telling that to her and I felt like that added a lot to the story. This book gave me all the feminist feels like I might cry. Oh my goodness. It was so good. It's about women's empowerment, women's strength, how women endure horrible things, how women rely on each other, how women need to speak their truth and deserve to be heard. It's everything. So those are all the books I read in September. I think that was... Ten, which is impressive, although we will say four of them were graphic novels and one of them was a children's picture book. But, you know, we worked like 40 hours a week, six days a week, every week this month. So, I'm gonna take it. Thanks for watching. I love you. Bye.